I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS, and uh, I'm really uh, grateful that everyone's coming here. I know there are other things going on uh, today in Washington. There's uh, the Interaction Conference and um, several other uh, worthy activities. My colleagues uh, across the way are also hosting a, a very interesting conversation. So I, I really appreciate people taking time out of their schedules to be with us. I also want to thank uh, my friends at KPMG for making this event possible. They understand that we need to go further on partnerships, uh, that when they talk to their clients and partners in philanthropy and NGOs, companies and governments, a big part of the discussion is how to do this better, how to measure this, how to manage risk. And so KPMG gets this, and so I really have appreciated their uh, partnership on, on making this event happen, happen today. Um, it's also a part of the fact that we've come a long way on partnerships. Uh, we're in a different place than we were 10 years ago. When I first got involved with this, we're certainly in a different place than when folks like Bill Reese, who was working on this before it was cool, or when Kurt Reinsma was getting this started as part of the GDA. 12 years ago, I think we're in a very, very different place. It's a, um, USAID has come a long way. Uh, we're recognized, the US government is recognized by OECD in a recent review of the US government as sort of a leader among OECD governments on the issue of public-private partnerships. And when I talk about partnerships, I want to use the term that aid uses, which is the mobilization of ideas, efforts, and resources of governments businesses and civil society in the broadest sense of the word to stimulate economic growth, develop businesses and workforces, address health and environmental issues, and expand access to education and technology. Uh, and it's certainly the case that uh, forces have changed the development landscape in the last 50 years. I think most of the people in this room have heard the statistic about how the resource flows have shifted over the last 50 years. And most of you have heard this, so I apologize in advance to all of you that, that have heard it. But every time I say it, there's somebody in the audience that has not heard this, which is that in the 1960s, something like 70% uh, of resources from the developing world to the United, from the United States to the developing world was official development assistance, and 30% was foreign direct investment, remittances, private philanthropy of some kind. That by today has completely flipped and then some, something like 87% of resources from the United States to the developing world is some form of private economic engagement, philanthropy, remittances, foreign direct investment, and something like 13% or less, depending on the year and depending on how you cut it, is some form of foreign aid. So ODA, the, the technical term for official foreign assistance, is a minority shareholder in the business of development. Uh, but the way in which our systems in U the U.S. government are designed, our thinking, our planning, our incentives are built around the, f the assumption that the U.S. government, or whether it's the World Bank or DFID uh, or others around the world as official donors, is that official donors have the largest wallet and therefore it warrants that they get to have the largest rule book. However, what we need to do is shift from largest wallet largest rule book to a paradigm that is catalytic wallet and flexible rule book. And so I think that's the, the thing to take away. And we're not yet there. Um, I do think, though, um, in this administration, Secretary Clinton has been the driving force, was the driving force for much of the energy around partnerships. She gave a phenomenal speech uh, in the first half of 2009 at the Global Philanthropy Forum on this topic. Um, so she, she was really tremendous. And I think there's been a series of uh, uh, a proliferation within the administration, both among career and political staff, of supporters of the concept of partnerships. It's become politically correct to use the term public-private partnership and to think, and to at least rhetorically do it. It has that doesn't mean that people's people's people time and money, and whether you allocate people time and money, has necessarily followed the rhetoric, but. Uh, it has said, it has, at least it's now politically correct, and I think that's a, a step in the right direction. Um, I do, I will say several challenges that I want to cite, and then I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to Lord Michael Hastings from KPMG to make some opening remarks. But um, I was up on the Hill six months ago. Uh, we just, did, we did a report, I think that most of them have been picked up already, about our shared opportunity, a vision for global prosperity, which was a bipartisan effort that included folks like Tom Daschle and uh, Carly Fiorina and Vin Weber and, and Tom Pritzker, among many others, that looked at the issue of the power and the role of the private sector in development. And we had a whole series of recommendations about how the US government needs to be a better partner to the private sector and to 
shoot for trying to make 25 percent of all the activities that the U.S. government does through partnerships. Uh, whereas I think if you if you noodled out what the U.S. aid, for example, is doing in the form of public-private partnership, it's somewhere around three to five percent, more or less, depending on how you you cut it. And I'm, I'll ask Rob to correct me later if if, if that's not the case. But that's my sense. Um, so I think there's still. Uh, when I was raising this on the Hill, I was saying uh, six months ago when we were talking about this as, as part of our work for this our shared opportunity. Um, the, I got some interesting pushback from a senior staffer on the Hill who talked about, well, we're not interested in the privatization of, of assistance. So I thought there is still some sort of a, there's still a little bit of education still among some folks, both in the, in the bureaucracy, some folks who think about development policy. There's some reluctance or sort of, the, this, isn't, this isn't a comfortable thought. So this, it's still, a little, it's still some work to be done on the, on the mindset, but most of that's been completed. Um, the much bigger problems around systems planning, procurement, measurement, approach, incentives, and I think we're going to have a chance to talk about that in detail at this at this conference today. I mean, that's that's what this is about. Is about what's the next generation look like? What do we what do we need to fix? It's not it's not group therapy. It's not about saying oh everything's broken. It's about, that's not the question. But it's about identifying the cha we, we know many of the challenges. We're going to talk about some of the challenges. We're also going to talk about ways forward on a, on a number of fronts that I think are critical to, to pushing this agenda forward. Um, at the same time, for partnerships to work, we, we also, as part of the, the, the roll-up, the roll-out or build-up for this, we did a series of, of thought pieces. This one was with Anna Sato and uh, Ellie, Ellie Coates, who I think Ellie should be in the audience, and uh, Anna will be joining us shortly. Uh, that kind of fed into the larger report about seizing the opportunity of public-private partnerships. And we, we think that, you know, it still requires, we talked about in this report 18 months ago, is that th to do partnerships at AID or in the U.S. government still requires workarounds, that it still requires finding uh, shoestring and bubble gum and, and sort of work, clever workarounds and some very clever people who've been empowered have figured out ways to do this. So we need to, we still need to fix systems. Um, well, anyways, I think the I'm going to stop there because I think we're going to have some very uh, substantive discussions today. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to Lord Michael Hastings. You have his biography in front of you. He's the global head of citizenship at KPMG, had a very illustrious career at the BBC, uh, is involved with a number of very interesting initiatives at the World Economic Forum, is a leader and serves on boards of a number of development non, uh, NGOs in, in Africa and in the UK. So, uh, Lord Michael Hastings, if you would please join me up here, and please welcome Lord Michael Hastings. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Um, I'll try and just make some, I hope, useful comments that will set a different tone of conversation for us as we think about this theme. Uh, I began my short visit to the US, I always like to keep them short because it's so difficult getting through immigration. Um, I began this short visit with a board meeting in New York yesterday, and I'm a member of the board of Jeffrey Sachs's Millennium Promise. We sat discussing over a two and a half hour period what the future of development will look like beyond 2015. And in quick summary, we concluded around the board table that the future of development is technological and based on partnerships between where technology can apply information and solutions, and where investors will bring expertise and experience. It's a different way of thinking about what development might look like in the 2020s. Will the NGOs still be part of the question, or even the answer? Will governments have the dominant role any longer? Not if technology empowers and enables. And at the core of the conversation, yesterday was the place of civil society. This is a different form of partnership thinking. And I'm helped in this by my good friend, and I, I won't, won't give you his full name because it has 25 letters and he's Indian. Um, so of course I can't really say it, but I call him Danny. And uh, he says to me, just call me Danny, and that kind of suits rather well. He's the uh, General Secretary of Civicus. And writing an article passed on to me by Kate, who is here in the audience somewhere, um, last week, he writes about the role of development being fatally undermined without a vibrant civil society. Now, this is what he says, and I found it particularly interesting. If development 
is going to work effectively, we need to promote an enabling environment for civil society. Efforts to reduce poverty, tackle inequality, and resolve conflict will be fatally undermined if civil society is not engaged and empowered. He goes on to comment that so much of the euphoria and optimism surrounding the Arab Spring has been lost amidst the chaos, corruption, and clampdowns on civil society that ensued in Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. And then adds further, a vibrant civil society supports development in a range of ways, from community-based organizations that deliver grounded and cost-effective services to independent voices that can hold governments to account. The development sector knows better than any that without transparency and accountability, the fight against global poverty will be fatally undermined by corruption and by waste. This is a new way of thinking about partnership. That partnership is not just the actions of bringing together the empowered, those with resources or those with decisions, usually somewhere between development agencies and governments, and maybe possibly business added on, but the necessary voice of those who are the receivers of the impact of development questions. I was also helped in my thinking on this by an article in the Daily Telegraph newspaper from London yesterday about a country which I have a particular keen interest in, which is Angola, because my father was Angolan and born just north of Luanda, and because it talks about a famous British company which has interesting resonance here in the US called BP. And um, BP has been exploring oil and gas off the coast of Angola for some considerable few years, has invested 20 billion already in Angola, producing some 200,000 barrels from particular well sites, looks to invest a further 15 billion, and according to the margins, is producing a profit in the region of $12 million per day. That's clear profit. And this is what the Delhi Telegraph says. What impact it might have on the rest of Angola is less clear. The country emerged from almost three decades of civil war in 2002. It is already Africa's second biggest oil producer, with oil accounting for three quarters of government revenues. But as the US Energy Information Administration notes, much of the oil wealth in the country does not find its way to the average citizen. Some 36% of the population live below the poverty line. A short distance from BP's offices in Luanda, barefooted children pick through mountains of rubbish in the slums. Angola consistently ranks as one of the world's most corrupt countries. And organizations such as Global Witness question where all license payments to Senegal, some of which are designated for social projects, actually end up. BP offers little clarity on the issue. It was once threatened with expulsion from Angola when it disclosed the value of a signature bonus. It now declines to do so, though com campaigners say a new EU transparency law may force its hand. Now let me be clear on my own reflections on this point. I believe that BP is doing the right service and a good service for the people of Angola. There is no point wasting the resource that a country like that has and not allowing it to come literally to the surface. But the question is how to empower a population to be able to take account of that wealth and allow that wealth to deliver goods for the public it seeks to serve. Without an enabled and empowered civil society, what place is there between business and government that allows for effective delivery, let alone important partnerships. Well, civil society is a conversation that is a new conversation that businesses are beginning to have. KPMG worked closely with the World Economic Forum on the production of this important report that was delivered at Davos this January, the future role of civil society. In this report, the World Economic Forum acknowledges that the changes that civil society is undergoing strongly suggest it should no longer be viewed as a third sector, that rather civil society should be the glue that binds public and private activity together in such a way that strengthens the common good. Let me give you an example of that. Next week, I go to Cape Town for the World Economic Forum Africa Summit. That summit will be a very positive expose of the new mood of Africa rising. There is no question about it that there is 
exponentially significant growth across the continent. Much of Africa's growth rates we would envy in the West, and I can particularly tell you in Europe. We'd be delighted to see rates between 6 to 8% as so many African countries are enjoying, and also delighted to see some of the significant progress on infrastructure and electrification that is taking place. But the centre of our conversations next, next week is going to be how to bring about a kind of partnership that allows the public voice of effective, educated, empowered new Africans, in other words, the young generation who feel that this is a country to be taken, how to allow those voices to come to the fore. And our test to bed is going to be Kenya. So how are we going to consider that option? Well, we've begun to have conversations about the empowered place of where technology, particularly through the mobile phone, allows the public to both receive and express opinion. Now, this was a partnership between the UK's development agency, DFID, and Vodafone. I happen to be a trustee of the Vodafone Global Foundation, so I take some delight in the fact that Vodafone, with the UK's development agency, established the M-Pesa network some nine years ago. But now, M-Pesa represents 36% of the GDP of Kenya. There isn't a household that does not trade through the mobile phone either banking-related information or increasingly health insurance access, savings products, and mortgage accounts. The opportunity technology has allowed where private sector engagement and public investment have brought about empowered civil society. So the public have a strong voice. The Kenyan people were able to take massive constitutional change in the most recent elections. Whatever we may make of the outcome and whatever we think of the rulings of the Supreme Court, the public voice was heard. It was heard and enabled with technology support. All of a sudden, democratic institutions begin to take authority. With that, not only are politicians, but also businesses held to account. An interesting quote appeared in Time magazine just a few weeks ago, this one under the banner of Made in the USA, but the quote was not really about manufacturing in the USA. It was Angela Merkel telling off Mr. Putin, uh, both of which you note the Time magazine had colored in yellow. And uh, Angela Merkel turns to Mr. Putin and says, a vibrant civil society can only exist when individual organizations can work without fear or concern. Now, this goes exactly back to Danny's point. If civil society, in other words, the voice of those concerned about the structures of the society they live in, that could be a business voice, that could be a government voice, that could be an NGO voice, it could be a complainant voice, or it could be a democratic voice. It could be a public voice or an individual voice. But where that voice has the right to be spoken and to be heard, there is, in effect, empowerment. One of my other uh, overnight readings was this interesting report from the House of Commons International Development Committee assessing the role of DFID and its expenditure plans for the period 2011 to 2013. As you can see, I do fascinating things overnight. And uh, <laughs> while I was uh, reading through this report in the early hours, in fact, this morning, I came across an important statement from the permanent secretary to the Department for International Development in the UK, who says the following, talking about the experiences uh, undertaken recently in Rwanda and Uganda. He says, we also try to make sure we get the best out of our local staff in informing us of what is going on in the wider environment. I was, says the permanent secretary, in Rwanda three weeks ago and Uganda last week. And some of the best intelligence I got on what is going on and what we should really be caring about was not actually from President Kigami or President Museveni, both of whom I had good conversations with, but was from the citizens of the country. This is a new and fascinating paradigm. All of a sudden, public voices begin to count. The public want to feel in countries like Angola, as I say, from where my father came, and Ghana now too, where we have a significant interest, and I say that as a Millennium Promise board member with the UK DFID investing 18 million pounds, and by the way, that's an increasing currency, uh, 18 million pounds, <clears throat> 
sorry about that. I'm a little British joke at the expense of Americans. Um, uh, investing £80 million in conjunction with the uh, Ghanaian government in a network of northern villages, the intention of which is through partnership to allow villages, uh, six villages of 7,000 people each, to come to sustainable and effective independence in their own right. So what is the purpose of today's partnerships? It's not just to enable buildings to appear well or infrastructure to look shiny, nor is it to make sure that we can attest to development investment wisely spent. I believe very firmly that the most important power of partnerships is to allow the public the right to take account for the future of their own communities and their own countries, to enable revenues accrued through assets to be formed into tax value, for that tax value to support the infrastructure, education, health, and services that are required, for the public to hold the governments to genuine account through serious knowledge and empowerment, and for technology to be a route of support and source for all of that. So partnerships, to me, have a new twist. The twist is the voice of the public, and the voice of the public could be that of the chief executive as much as the government official, as much as the donor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Hastings. I'm going to ask my friends and pa fellow panelists to come up, please. British, uh, let's see, who else? Bill is here, Paula, and uh, Miss Mohapi, if you'd please come up. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, this panel is going to be on the record. We're live streaming this and we're also recording it for posterity. So I think um, you all have the biographies of the panelists in front of you, but I think this is a very interesting group to help us set the stage for the rest of the afternoon. I also think Lord Hastings' comments also think help inform and frame up the discussion that we're going to be having. I wanted to pull this group together to, to get a sense of the state of play of multi-sector partnerships. Uh, uh, coming back to what, what we said earlier about that we've gone a long way in public-private partnerships, but I think that there are a series of challenges for us to confront if we want to take partnerships to further scale and also to use, as uh, Lord Hastings was saying, for example, use the civil society and the nonprofit sector as the glue uh, for these uh, for these larger larger scale multi-sector partnerships. So. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Bill Reese to, to help kick off this discussion, and then I'm going to ask Paula Luff to, um, to then to go second. I'm going to have British go third, and then I'm going to have Ms. Mohapi from MCA Lesotho go fourth. Bill, please. Thank you, Dan. And Lord Hastings, your, our common friend Jane Nelson was right. You, she alerted me that you would provoke us and, and frame the issues well, so it's nice to follow. That, this, in this case, it's good to follow you. Uh, <laughs> And he is absolutely right. I'm going to give a, a case study of sorts of one of the very first official Global Development Alliance projects that Kurt and Holly Weiss and Andrew Natsios and Dan Rundy helped get off the ground 13 years ago. I'm reminded that of the saying that it takes 10 years to raise a 10-year-old. And we do too many projects in the development world in three-year segments and hope that the world changes. I'm going to tell you a story of one that's 13 years old now that is blossoming, but it shouldn't be looked at as old. Development takes a long time to happen, and what, and what we need to see is scale and sustainability and effective practices all being invested at the same time. And if we're concerned about the voices of people, what's the largest cohort of voices out there? Young people because we've got the largest cohort of, of people under 30 in the history of the world. And yes, higher percentages of those in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, but high enough in Spain to make Spain not necessarily a sustainable country going forward with 50% of its young people unemployed. So let me tell you about a, 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 a program that is core to what we do, uh, more as a case study of IYF creating with other stakeholders and multiple 
uh, a, a long-standing project. But then I want to draw at the very end of it. Dan has asked us to talk about the state of play. I think there's some lessons that can be learned, not just for those of us who are involved, but particularly for our government in, in, a, in a very respectful way. What have we learned? Because I do remember sitting with Andrew Natsios in his little office at the time, because he hadn't been confirmed yet uh, by the Senate, and he said he was going to launch this thing with Secretary Powell called the Global Development Alliance, and in two years they'd have it up and running, and then they'd mainstream it, and it would be working. And I said, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa bureaucracies don't change that quickly that you could mainstream it I don't think in two years and then then have it functioning like as if it's plug and play and then if you think about engineering some brand new partnerships you won't have the agreement signed for a year and then it'll be a year or two after that you get your first results and there goes your two-year window so let's think about extending this this thing out so a program that our foundation and the Inter-American Development Bank was creating at that time, we took to the GDA office and said, how about learning with us about partnership building and management by getting on a train that hasn't left the station but is halfway out, and if you get on, you can get some good leverage. And it's called, it was called then Entra 21. And the logo of the program was your enter button on the computer that in Spanish and Portuguese would be Entra. And these were the IT skills and what we defined as life skills, the, the skills that young people are going to need to enter and be successful in a 21st century job market or work, workplace. And we were in, interpreting enter in a broad sense, not just a young kid getting his or her first job, but hopefully that job being one in which you'd have some sort of upward mobility that we can take for granted in a middle class uh, OECD-type country, but in many parts of the world, the first job might be the best job a young person may ever get. Entra 21 taught us a lot of lessons. It was created by our foundation and the, the multilateral investment fund of the IDB, which itself took a major risk and, and a new way of doing business. At that point, the MIF had been making, had made about 400 grants of about a million dollars apiece. This is a, actually a fund that lives within the IDB, obviously then only for IDB eligible countries in the Americas. Uh, but it was a fund to support the private sector, not support governments. Private sector growth and, and all. This then became the first project they ever funded for youth. Enrique Iglesias, the president of the bank, had a real interest in youth, but the MIF would have only been interested in it if it had a private sector component. Well then how do, why don't we go after these out of school, out of work youth? And back 13 years ago, we weren't calling them ninis then, like the Latinos do, or neets now, as we've called it in the United States, neither in school or in education or employment or training. So nini went to neat in English. That was our cohort. Um, the bank put up $10 million, and we had to raise dollar for dollar cash, $10 million to match it. And we were to train. 12,000 young people for jobs and employ 40% of them. Now, you might think 40% is awfully low, but the job training programs that the bank had been financing through loans to Latin governments were ranging from 15 to 25% employment rates and some of our own uh, job corps programs in the United States because you're dealing with a tough cohort. Uh, uh, and so 40% was the marker. Suffice to say that we raised $20 million to match the MIFs 10, trained 20,000 people. Those are the numbers. Aid came in and put $3 million down, and we literally signed some blank pieces of paper at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that day because the MOU hadn't been finally or formally written, but we were, this was the coming out party of the, of the GDA, and they wanted to look like we were signing something. So. I give aid all the credit in the world there for wanting to be, be part of this. The interesting thing for the bank, because the bank itself was making a, as I say, was breaking its mold. It had never made a multi-country, multi-project grant. If they had made 400 grants for about $400 million, here was one where they were going to fund conceivably 30-some projects in 15 or 20 countries, and IYF would run the umbrella a regional program. That was new to them. They had never done that. 
But what we convinced them to do is, well, if you normally would put thirty or forty thousand dollars aside f to evaluate these little projects of a million dollars apiece, if we're going to raise twenty or so million dollars to fund a series of, of workforce programs, let's do an evaluation across the 35 and compare. They had never been able to compare their different projects because they were each one was funded and managed separately and evaluated separately. And how do you learn? Well, you only learn by doing a bunch of things and then being able to compare it. That was probably the most revolutionary thing of, of, of that program. Um, suffice to say, oh, and let me just say too, that the, the program was so big and different that I was asked to come to the bank and speak to the vice presidents of the bank who are in, 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 in the, and the executive directors who are the donors committee basically of the MIF. And they wanted, of course, to rehearse me because they probably didn't trust an NGO, even though they'd given us the money already, to come in and, and, and speak properly to these, these important people. And as I was getting into my rehearsal, I mentioned that we were going to, we believe very seriously in the life skills, showing up every day, communicating well, working in teams, taking orders, solving problems, maybe giving some orders, those things that one has to do day to day on the job to, to get your job done and, 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 and do it productively. And one of the guys said, time out, time out. You're an NGO, you're gonna do all that blah, 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 BS that NGOs do, that humanitarian stuff about life skills. This is an IT program. And don't talk about it. it, it's an IT program, that's the way we're looking at it, for young people. And all that life skills stuff, you can do it, but don't, 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 don't make a big deal of it. The same person came to me about a year later and said, I want to apologize. And I had basically forgotten. I said, whatever you want, you're giving us that much money. If you don't want me to talk about life skills, I won't. He came back and apologized and said, the employer surveys are saying that that's the most important part of this program. The IT stuff you're teaching them for 21st century skills rather than teaching young women to paint nails and boys to pound nails. This was, these were IT skills we were gonna teach, but they were saying, we get it now. That life skills are important because the employers are telling that from the surveys we were doing of the employers who were hiring these young people, saying basically the IT skills were good, but we can't teach them these other things like showing up every day, working in teams, communicating well, solving problems, managing your time, and all the rest. Well, it worked. And the bank then made, five years later, the, the same bank that didn't make multi-country grants under an umbrella, it never made second grants to anyone. They made a second grant for another $10 million. So these were the f largest two grants that the MIF had ever made. I say that because all of these big multilaterals and bilaterals, I think, have learned a great deal. And we've learned together how to structure some of these things. And I just want to keep that learning moving so that we don't have to reinvent the wheels uh, further on. The second program, the second phase, was to do some things differently. And the two things that would be different, it would also be a competitive grants program to maybe this time 20 or so projects around which we do an umbrella learning piece that was contracted out, wasn't done by us, contracted out to Latin consulting firms or Latin universities to come in and do a serious, the type of M&E that we talk about today as if that's just the way we always have done business. Uh, the two dif differentiation points here were that we were gonna try to take as many projects similar to ones in the first round to scale and, and then try to learn from that. How do you scale projects? And to some of us, if, if we're not doing scale and development, what the hell are we doing? I mean, enough of these pilot little projects, if we can't learn what works and how to scale it and, and move it on, because the numbers are too staggering. It, at least they are in the, with the youth co cohort the size it is. And then secondly, to get at some harder to reach young people. Now, frankly, a 15, 18, 20 year old who's neither in school, neither in work, has gone to four or five or six years of schooling, isn't, in other words, illiterate, and whose family is earning less than two f minimum salaries, which means each person is get maybe getting about a dollar a day. That's pretty hard to reach right there, I think. But we, we agreed that we would go to some harder to reach folks, and those would be in more rural areas, 
Of course, it's hard to do scale in rural areas sometimes. And disabled people, ex-combatants, and gang members or would-be gang members in Central America. So it gave us some different cohorts to continue the learning because out of this, we weren't just trying to train a bunch of kids for their first jobs, but to, to learn from this, that we could share those learnings across the region, which you can do if you're doing it in an umbrella fashion, and hold learning conferences with public and private sector folks so that you learn what is working in these projects, but also working, frankly, to build public-private partnerships. So the public-private piece is that companies from all over the United States, but also Nokia and Samsung and Deutsche Bank and others put money into match the MIF and the aid money. But we were also trying to model public-private partnerships so that Brazilian and Colombian and Honduran companies would come in. Now, some of those Brazilian ones today are working with our foreign aid program because they're Odebrecht, they're Comargo Cojea, they're Petrobras that are gigantic multinational companies. But beneath all these things, just like in our own country, who are the richest, what's the richest segment of our, our economy? It's smaller and medium-sized businesses. Why are public-private partnerships the province only of major global companies? And if we could begin to model that, that would be the real sustainability for funding and political, or call it today, as we call it, country ownership. If the country's indigenous business sector and its local governments can get on board with these things through seeing and being part of functioning and well-monitored programs, then you can build the scale and sustainability we all want. Suffice to say, that second phase was supposed to train 50,000 people, it trained 100,000 people. Uh, the, the scaling up of governmental stuff, a project in Medellin with, the, with the, the mayor of Medellin had been supportive of in the first round, went from 500 to 7,000. A hospitality program that we did in Bahia, Brazil, the Ministry of Tourism came in, not the Ministry of Education or Vocational Training, the Ministry of Tourism came in and said, can you take that Salvador experience that 11 other state capitals, all of which are destinations for international folks, but particularly Brazilians themselves, and hospitality is the largest employer in the world. So some real learnings were done there about scale and sustainability and working with governments. Along the way, this program won GDA's 2007 Global Development Alliance of the Year Award, which we were very proud of, but frankly, what we were proud of was the GDA, this fellow, had the wherewithal to give us a, a certificate, but to give Microsoft and Nokia and General Electric and all the rest a winning certificate saying you're the partners in this with us along with the MIF. And just this last year, the Ag Fund, the Arab Gulf Fund, which is a large philanthropy uh, in Saudi Arabia, awarded Entra 21 its largest global prize of the year because their, their youth unemployment is important to them and they were looking at a 10, 12 year track record and wanting to scale it up and take it to other parts of the world. But an Arab foundation awarding an American institution for doing work in Latin America I thought was was pretty terrific. Let, let me just talk about rippling out of some of this stuff then. One ripple out is that the World Bank in its 2007 World Development Report on youth called Development and the Next Generation which almost says it takes a generation to develop that adult you want out of a the outcome of a youth youth development program I like to say is a healthy, civically engaged, and employed adult. And when you do it, when societies, whole of government, whole of country, do that well, society gets a 50-year return on investment from a healthy 20-year-old becoming a viable citizen, parent, and worker. An unemployed 25 or 28-year-old probably will never get really employed or well employed. That person won't live for 50 more years probably because he or she will be unhealthy, won't have a productive family, certainly won't pay taxes, and you've got a drag. So development in the next generation, which was the title of that World Bank report, is a great way of framing it. They created then a global partnership for youth employment, of which we're the secretariat, to take those learnings from ENTRA, which they called one of the few proven practice programs that they could find to write up in their 2007 World Development Report and say, how can, we, how can we take some of that to Africa and the Middle East? I have been in, in parts of Africa and the Middle East where English and uh, Portuguese and Spanish are not spoken. 
but they will tell me, can you bring us some of that Entra 21 stuff? I don't know where they've heard about it, but the brand got out there and they say, you know, we've got some of the same issues. They'll have to be adapted, of course, but bring it, bring it on. Microsoft then published with us about a year ago a, a white paper called Opportunity for Action. And the opportunity is, to, to put a positive spin on it, if we can get this younger generation more employed than previous generations, there's a demographic dividend to be paid for if you've got that large a cohort of young people. But if we don't, and I don't want to go to all the, 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 the negative stuff, uh, a more unemployed largest cohort of teenagers and young adults in the history of the world and in certainly in, in, in certain parts of the world will be destabilizing politically. It's not just a human issue. It's not just an economic issue. It will be a stability and security issue. That hospitality case I talked to you about, well, we took to Davos this last January a paper that we wrote with the Hilton company called Hospitality, I'm sorry, Opportunities for Youth in Hospitality, stating that that industry, hospitality and, and travel, will employ in a, even a still slow-growing global economy 73 million new people over the next 10 years. Who are most of them going to be? People at the base of the pyramid, young people. You don't, they're not going to be 73 million people with masters, MBAs, and hotel management. They're going to be people who come in at the bottom of what can be an upwardly mobile uh, industry. How can they come in with the life skills that they need? As Chris DeSetta, who co-wrote the paper with us, the head of Hilton Worldwide, said, I can train people to work in the hospitality industry, and we'll do that. I can't train them in the life skills. They have to come here with that already. Can you provide us with this? And we'll fund an expansion, if you will, of Entra 21 and, and all for hospitality. We'll help fund that. But I want to bring in, too, he said, my other members of the hospitality industry. This isn't a Hilton CSR. This is our industry. Now, if we can talk, start talking about employment as an industry and not just one company at a time, again, we're, then you're going to real mega scale. The last two things I want to talk about just to show the rippling out of this. So Entra 21 had two phases, one and two that I told you about. The third phase was what we announced in, in Cartagena last April, just a year ago now. Uh, at the Cartagena Summit of the Americas, where all the democratically elected heads of state come together. Youth unemployment was right way up there on their agenda. Well, we announced a third phase, and of course, by that time, you need to give it a new name, so it's called New Economic Opportunities for Youth. And this was something that the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, Luis Alberto Moreno, Cemex, the Mexican gigantic cement company, Microsoft, Walmart, Arcos Dorados, which is Golden Arches, but this is the wholly owned company, private company that owns all the McDonald's franchises in Latin America that employs 80,000 new people a year. And what's the fifth company? Caterpillar committed $50 million to announce the first phase of NEO. Well, that's the third phase of Entra. And that, I think, is a story then about scale, sustainability, proven results, and true private sector buy-in. And just to Lord Hastings, the, 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 the World Economic Forum is terribly important. And we're happy to know that they're wanting to make now youth employment. And I'll be going to Geneva in late August to figure out how can we put this more on the agenda of the January meeting next, next year. And not about, woe is me, the sky is falling, look at all these demographic indicators and all, but how can we talk about the scalable public-private partnerships that fit your definition. Uh, learnings from this, let me just say the word co-creation was used, I think, by Lord Hastings and, and, and Dan. The, the essence of what we have built here and others are doing too is truly a co-creation of, and it's triangular, or sometimes it might have more than three edges and, and, and and uh, to it. It's, it's multiple governments at times, or multiple layers of governments, and multiple companies. I would, my suggestions to the U.S. government, with all due respect for what they have done to mainstream and, 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 and model and all this, is to not think, though, that 
public-private partnerships can be pre-engineered and pre-designed only in government, and then government invites in people to help pay for it. That's okay, and it will work in some cases. Um, but I think there is a real role for government to just react like VCs would react. VCs don't have the idea. VCs have the money. It's the young entrepreneur that brings the idea, then the VCs sort it out and say, well, we'll give you a little or we won't give you a lot or come back a little bit later or we'll give you a bunch. And I think our government somewhere in there between state and aid and some of the other agencies that, that play around in this area need to make sure that they don't try to pre-engineer and drive everything from the governmental side and be open to the creative ideas that come. That would be one thing. Some would call that walking around money. I don't call it that. I, I think it's, it's frankly, it's, it's second stage, it's mezzanine funding, it's the type of thing that governments could do when an idea looks pretty damn good and maybe even has some initial findings and now that governments could come in and leverage but, but help scale it. Governments have also the, the, the need at time, f and, and, and I use the word quick wins, but it's not my, my word. Uh, we've been, we, we're, we work very well with AID in the State Department, but it's come into our vocabulary, their vocabulary in the last few years. Let's get some, let's start something big, but let's get some quick wins. And that frankly is antithetical, I think, most of the time to getting good things done. That, and particularly public-private partnerships with a bunch of stakeholders have to have the patience to get it designed right. And quick wins actually don't argue for that. And just to close, I'd like to say, again, what, uh, emphasize again what I said earlier. Public-private partnerships aren't just the province of the KPMGs and the glo big global companies. We need them as models, and yet they have their subsidiaries, and when the subsidiaries can buy in, it's almost a local company. And they can bring in their B2B partners at that local level, because truly the wealth out there in most of these countries is not in our global companies that are doing business in their countries, although they're, they're pretty wealthy. But also, if we can get the, the local private sector in, you not only get tap mega bucks resources, but it buys you that sustainability, political will, and country ownership that I think we're all looking for if developing countries are going to sustain their growth. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to ask Paula to, to speak next. Paula, you had a, you've had several lives. Your most recent is your vice president like of, of corporate social responsibility at the Hess Corporation. You were a great partner to us here at CSIS as a council member for our, our development council that helped us produce the, our shared opportunity report. So, Paula, I hope you'll, you'll speak to the, the, the private sector perspective on, on this conversation. I'm feeling really old because I've, I realized uh, coming down here on the plane that I've been in this field nearly 20 years. And, um, you started as a child prodigy. I was five. Yeah, child I was prodigy. five. Uh, uh, but what's there. interesting in hearing Lord Hastings and, and Bill and you, Dan, is that my career has sort of paralleled this evolution from random acts of kindness and philanthropy to strategic <laughs> partnerships yeah. where there are many voices at the table. Um, when I first got to Pfizer, I didn't even know what the private sector was. I came out of the NGO world, uh, as you know, Dan. And um, Pfizer was very, I think, very forward thinking at the time. Uh, they wanted to build a department that built strategic and meaningful partnerships with civil society that could pr point to real outcomes um, uh, and measure them over time. And they felt that to do this, they didn't need a corporate communications person or, or uh, someone from, from in-house, but really to bring in people from the NGO sector who knew how NGOs worked, who could speak the language and serve as interpreters between the sectors. Um, and so uh, 13 years at Pfizer began with that. When I first came into this field, I think we were just at the cusp of talking about public-private partnerships. And I think at the time, Business was interested. You know, they realized that a lot of money was walking out the door in $5,000 increments, and at the end of the day, they couldn't really talk about what they had accomplished. And so there was a, a switch to say, okay, well, if we're going to be spending significant money in the community, we'd like to be able to say that over time we've achieved certain things. Um, and they realized that to do that, they needed to partner uh, with NGOs uh, to that end. But I think that the conversation in the late 80s, early 90s was largely one way. It wasn't really voices around a table reaching consensus, but it was, I'd like to make an impact in education in pick your country. Um, I think I'd like to build schools. I'd like to work with you because you have a track record of building schools. We'll let the government know what we're doing, and then we'll hand over the keys. 
um, and talk about uh, you know unidirectional unidirectional thinking. You know, the reality was I think lots of good projects happen, but there's not a lot uh, left in terms of you know long-term sustainability. And I think people were naive in thinking about what sustainability would be. You know, it's not about the school still having a fresh coat of paint. It's about what kind of intellectual capital have you built in a society. Um, you can't, you know, learning never goes, gets rusty. Uh, capacity never needs a coat of paint or, or a little extra cement. So I think that was a big learning. Um, you know, then I think over time, uh, particularly when, when the AIDS crisis happened in Africa, I think companies uh, like my former company be, um, realized that if we were not at the table with stakeholders, uh, really rolling up our sleeves shoulder to shoulder and coming up with solutions uh, together to intractable problems that none of us as an individual sector or player had the solutions to, then we would be uh, on the menu for lunch uh, and deserved it. Uh, and so I think that was a huge wake-up call. It wasn't just about this, you know, one directional kind of conversation, I would like to do and I'd like you to implement. It was, it was really around engaging with stakeholders and listening to them. What a concept, listening to people, uh, listening to what their, their desires were, what they thought sustainability and meaningful impact meant. Um, and, you know, together with, with PEPFAR and other partners, I think at least the, the pharmaceutical industry, I think made great strides in beginning to listen. I remember when I worked for Pfizer, I was on a site visit in Zimbabwe to uh, an HIV program with the Ministry of Health. And when I was in one of the back rooms, one of the record keepers was showing me the various logs that they had to keep uh, for the various donations programs. And I think they were part of maybe five or six. And everyone with different reporting requirements, et cetera. And I began to think, you know, surely there's got to be a better way of, you know, extending services and, and meaningful um, services to people at the field level. And so um, I began to think, you know, it's, it's probably time to start making people customers and to stop this language of recipients and beneficiaries and program participants, but really think about, you know, how do you engage societies and countries as customers, as, par as true partners in development? Uh, if you can do that, then you do build something sustainable. Now I'm, I'm in the oil patch, um, and uh, we have, you know, a number of large long-term partnership programs where we operate. Um, and I think what's interesting about the company I work for now is that um, it's not a very big oil company by oil company standards. It is Fortune 100, but compared to an Exxon or a Chevron, it's, it's quite small. Yet we're competing for many of the same assets. And so our management feels that uh, stakeholder engagement and meaningful partnership with civil society and with government uh, is sort of a competitive advantage for us. I think our management would like a country to say to another country, hey, you should look at Hess, uh, because they'll leave your country better off for having been there. So it's a very different proposition. Um, and while these partnerships that we have going, whether they're in education or healthcare, are very meaningful, in and of themselves, they're not sufficient to ensure development. So what are the other things that companies do? Well, while we may spend you know, five or $10 million a year at an asset on a philanthropy program, we probably are spending over a billion dollars a year in capital, uh, in hiring people, in paying taxes, and other long, long kind of term commitments. And so through our supply chain um, and through our business activities, I think we can make an even more enormous impact than, than through the, the philanthropy, which is, which is critical, but not sufficient in and of itself to make a lasting contribution. And to have that country say, they'll leave you better off for having been there. You know, one of the things that um, not only have the voices come to the table in my 20 years in this field, but to Dan's earlier point, the balance has shifted. Um, we're not talking as much about foreign assistance, although it will always have a very, very valuable place in the toolkit, no question about it. But, but really, it's now about foreign direct investment. And, and can you make a country and a people your customer? Can you become uh, not just a multinational, but actually a national company where you operate uh, and, and, and be there for the long haul. So that's kind of the, the change I've seen. And uh, let's see if I make it another 20 years. We've got a long way to go, for sure. We're not there yet. Um, but um, I think that if we can have meaningful dialogue and make really get a handle on the, the full pantheon of tools at our disposal, together, listening to each other, really collaborating, um, the world will continue to develop. And maybe we'll even get to the bottom of the pyramid and lift it up to the top. Thanks, Paula. Thanks very much. Uh, 
very grateful my friend British Robinson, who's a senior vice president for innovation and strategic initiatives at Women for Women International, uh, agreed to join this panel. Uh, uh, British, as many of you know, had a had a past career in government, and I'm hoping she'll speak to both sort of the a little bit of the government perspective as a recent alum, but also sort of an outsider looking in and sort of providing a little bit of an outsider looking now that you know that she's crossed the divide and is now a, a senior leader at Women for Women. She'll have a she'll have she'll be able to take a little bit of a, a an outside take as well. British. Great, thanks, Dan, and good afternoon. Um, Lord Hastings, thank you so much for your comments, and, and Bill and, and Paula. Um, I, I kind of going to make this a little more tactical. I think I think you both were at, at a very high level and, and provide some of um, my thoughts while in government, but also, as Dan said, um, afterwards. I, I want to kind of take us back up to the top, kind of how did we get here? I think there are a lot of people that are working in this space um, that are starting to enter the space or have been in it for a while. Well, how did we get here? I think Paula alluded a bit to this. and it. And it really touches on exactly where Lord Hastings started, which is civil society, it's the voices, as Bill put it, and it's the stakeholders, as Paula put it. And that's where I want to start. I want to take a, a minute to go back. So this movement, Dan asked me to talk a little bit about the evolution of public-private partnerships and the trends. Prior to my arrival at the State Department, I actually worked um, in SRI, or Social Responsible Investing, um, with a large institutional investor, um, uh, faith-based institutional investor. And a lot of that work that was done, stakeholder dialogue, institutional heavy um, institutional investment, um, taking into account those voices in civil society, really got started in probably the late 80s, early 90s, um, where you saw actually billions of dollars, including not only faith-based institutional investors, but pension funds, large pension funds, hospital systems, those sorts of things. We're putting trillions of dollars, actually, in the mid-90s, late 90s, and had significant power and influence over where this space, if you will, this theory of change is now and is going, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So you had the ICCR, the Interfaith um, Corporate Council on Social Responsibility. You had institutional investors. And we were responding, those groups at the time, and I was part of that large institutional investment community, we were responding to the HIV AIDS crap crises in Africa, two environmental issues, two issues around sweatshops and child labor and things of that nature, and then also dealing with extract extractive industries vis-a-vis -vis sort of civil conflict. So that's how we started. The SRI sort of portfolio or base, I believe, the social responsible investing space, really paved the way for companies to move from charity and philanthropy to what we now call CSR programming. They figured out that you couldn't just keep giving money, as Paula was saying, it wasn't getting you anywhere at $5,000 increments, but to actually responding to those stakeholder voices, civil society voices saying you have to be a better actor, that you can do well and do good, right? We all know that sort of information. But that came from this movement that preceded this concept called public-private partnerships. And I think those of us who have worked in this space have not given enough credit to the SRI movement. I don't believe we would be here today. I don't believe that GDA would have had the would have been enabled enough to be even created within USAID had those folks not gone before us, had we not listened to civil society, had we not engaged in stakeholder investment as large institutional investors. So that's one. Once that happened, and, we, and everybody talked about the triple bottom line and things like that, once we moved through that, then we started to see this confluence of relationships building, the institutional development actors, so DFID, USAID, the State Department, World Bank, the UN family, et cetera, et cetera, started realizing we couldn't do this alone. Corporate started to realize they couldn't do it alone. And then these things called alliances in the classic USAID sense started to form, right? And you had really smart people thinking, building, taking risks, pushing the envelope to get us to that place. Then we moved from, you know, we all talk about, you know, our wonderful colleague at Harvard, Michael Porter, incredible work. So we went from SRI to philanthropy and charity slash CSR to, in the early 2000s, thanks to the leadership of, of GDA and USAID, to this core competency space. And those of us at State Department and PEPFAR and MCC, we all started to pick up on that. 
we don't just want to partner with you because of your check writing ability or the cash, but we now want to start to build capacity of civil society. We want to empower people. We want to work with you through your business line. What are you good at Coca-Cola? Supply and value chain. Pfizer, what are you good at? Getting pills in people's mouths. So we began to change our way over the last, I would say, 10 years of how we do that. And now here we are today, Michael Porter has defined it at the top of the pyramid as shared value. That's where we are today, and I want to come back to that shared value question. So all of this was attractive, not because you were getting bad press around sweatshops or HIV AIDS, you weren't acting or whatever, but now it was big business, right? It was a win-win for all of us. And that as the U.S. government and DFID and other big donors, we realized there were the five C's, right? We came together around, we all had capital, capacity, creativity, connectivity, and credibility. And we were actually now equally yoked. USG donors were equally yoked in some ways with corporate sector, private sector, and even foundations, I would argue. Foundations, you know, the big old foundations, right, the Rockefellers and the MacArthur's were kind of doing this, some of this alone, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Well, now they had a new partner. But we as U.S. government, as different as UN, we were starting to do development differently. Just the concept of GDA said we're going to do something different, right, and we're going to push the envelope. That alone enabled this environment of more creative thinking about how we count things, how we move from just, you know, um, outcomes to impact. So there was a whole, there was an ecosystem kind of going on that was starting to build over time. So now, sort of 10 years later, after we move out of kind of the, the 90s, if you will, into the mid 2000s, um, I think that after we moved from big business, after we started doing development differently, I was struck when I started in the government in um, 2005, 2006, that as the U.S. government, um, State Department, USAID, we actually in some cases started to act as an angel investor, or at least this is the way I was talking amongst my colleagues, Dan and others at State. We have, and I specifically worked for PEPFAR and the U.S. government, which I think we all know now, you know, was a 50, is a 50, basically a $50 billion program. With that kind of money, were we actually required to, we had to go farther then, and we had to look at ourselves almost like investors, right? When you have a check that big, you start to look at yourself differently. And with the private sector, help us look at ourselves differently. So we really became innovators in some ways. It shifted from sort of pull roll to push roll. And that, I think, was remarkable for the U.S. government. And I want folks here to be really clear that I think USAID and State Department and PEPFAR had a huge part in that now what we call push roll. So you see things like PEPFAR, MCC, State Department, you know, looking at Asia and Africa and creating women-owned businesses and training and mentoring, that hadn't been done before really, right? So we looked at ourselves differently. And now um, I think the, the real entrepreneurship approach with, with, with grand challenges at USAID, another evolution, looking at USG, looking at itself as an, invest, as an investor, as an innovator, the same way as you were pointing out sort of the venture, the VC folks would look at themselves. Types of partnerships have changed as well. So we're seeing more mentoring, more twinning, more training, more secondments, more capacity building. Leaders like Pfizer, IBM, Intel, Google, actually seconding people into the U.S. government so that we have better outcomes on our development work, regardless of its maternal child health, HIV, environment, economic growth. We're seeing that shift. The style of partnerships have changed, and I would say the style has changed literally probably in the last three years. And here's what I mean by that. Companies are saying, guess what? You don't get to sort of design it, bring in the implementing partner. We are going to co-design this with you, and we're going to be pretty tough about it. I mean, really tough, or we're going to walk away. So there's this, this movement of co-design, which I think is a really good thing. There's also almost creating, and I think Dan and GDA did this early on with a couple of things, some interesting initiatives like GAIN and things like that, but creating almost like boards or secretariats or consortiums. That sort of coming back began because it's part of accountability, the accountability framework, but it's also part of the co-design, and we believe that it will get us to more sustainability, hopefully. The other thing is, the, the next thing on the, on the style of partnerships is, we, I know at State, and we did a number of co-designed 
partnerships with GDA was we would do a, we did a big initiative um, around food and food security with General Mills. Well, it was PEPFAR, USAID, and General Mills. Well, we didn't just, it wasn't just the three of us, but we intentionally built into this public-private partnership that we bring in other food companies, local, back to your point, local private sector wholesalers, and also other sort of the big boys, if you will, the Fortune 100s. And so that was something that we learned that you, you don't have to just stay within the way you started the partnership, but that it can evolve in and of itself into bringing other folks into the sector. Um, so that you even bring competitors together. And at first, I think, as USG, we really pushed on that. Um, and we, there were some interesting conversations internally, which I won't share now. Um, but we kind of figured out, let's push the competitors there because we're going to get better development outcomes. And I think we have on the books some deals that didn't go so well. Um, but we have a number that went really well. And the General Mills deal is still going very, very well, to your point. And it takes longer than two to three years. That's now almost probably four or five years old. So we have to be patient. There's a patient capital piece here. Um, I think I, I want to move just for the last couple of minutes on trends. So as I left State Department about a, just about a hair over a year ago, um, we are starting to see that um, Companies and foundations are, uh, were pivoting um, and slightly starting to bypass USG or DFID or donors and saying, hey, you know what? We're going to cut out the middleman. You guys have a lot of bureaucracy. You have a lot of paperwork. This is getting complicated. Or I'd like to say we, we taught them very well. We taught them how to do it. And that's going to get to a really big trend that I think we're seeing that I'm now seeing being a part of the NGO community is that we taught them so well they're almost able to do it on their own. It goes back to Lord Hastings' perspective. They're going right to civil society in these countries and they're cutting the deals with civil society. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think as US government and those working on both sides, um, we need to understand that a little bit more. Second thing is I think that there's a new, another trend that's emerging. Um, that's been emerging for a while I think as U.S. government, folks are questioning the value and the worth of public-private partnerships. You know, in other words, is the juice worth the squeeze? I think corporates and foundation folks are doing the same thing as well. Um, the other interesting trend is that we're seeing more partnering with social entrepreneurs and impact investors. That's about sustainability. That's about really getting on the ground and staying on the ground and enabling that local environment or creating local businesses so that it's not just the multinationals, but there's something that sticks and that we truly are building um, society and, the, and the ultimately um, the econo building up the economics of that society. The other thing um, I would say if uh, the, the last piece is I'm seeing them go it on their own but also uh, as they expand their businesses in these emerging and frontier markets, they're saying, USG, you're not moving fast enough. We want faster, better, cheaper, right? That's the mantra. Um, and so they want to see better outcomes and better results. So you're seeing the likes of very successful programs. And USG, um, State Department, USAID, DFID, um, actually enabled some of these companies to create some of these programs. We were, in a way, investors. And, and let me tell you who they were. STARS, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women's Program, Walmart.com, worked a lot with my colleagues at USAID on organic cotton and all sorts of interesting things. Coca-Cola, Mutar Kent's 5x20, you know, the Global Women's Issues Office at, at State Department, huge role in some of that. Nike and the girl effect, huge role. Starbucks, you know, Dan and, and the colleagues at GDA really helped enable Starbucks environment um, when they did some original GDAs in the, in the early, kind of early 2000s. Um, so we're seeing return in some ways on our investment as development folks, as USG. Um, I think we have to recognize that return on investment. Um, I, I recently saw it with Merck and cervical cancer um, working with PEPFAR. Um, so all of these things driving towards better lives, you know, economic growth, um, building up the SMEs in the local private sector. Um, but as development actors, is this new way okay? Was this, this, in some of these lessons learned and some of the evolution, I don't know that it was our intended outcomes, but I find it absolutely fascinating that this is where we are in 2013 um, and that we know it will require all of us to continue to act and do together. Um, but that as USG, we have to recognize some of the unintended consequences that we've done such a good job, maybe, 
even learning lots of lessons um, that we've allowed corporate sector and foundations um, to go it alone, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but I think as U.S. government, um, you'll have to constantly be re redefining um, place and space in this theory of change as it grows. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, British. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Ms. Sophia Mohapi, who's the CEO of the Millennium Challenge Account in Lesotho, who happened to be in town for um, a conference that MCC was hosting uh, on Monday. Um, and uh, I understand that she held her own with uh, former Secretary Condi Rice, so we're very uh, fortunate to have you here, Ms. Mohapi. Um, I'm going to ask you to just share a little bit about your experience with uh, MCA Lesotho and, and how you've, um, your, the work that you've been doing has been supporting the, the private sector more broadly and, and how you've engaged with the private sector. The floor is yours, Ms. Mohapi. Thank you very much, uh, Danielle. Um, I think speaking last is uh, an advantage in the sense that I've heard all the good things that have been said up to now by very experienced uh, people. Um, I think uh, countries such as mine, which have benefited from uh, support by the U.S. government under the Millennium Challenge Corporation, should consider themselves very fortunate in the sense that we are now benefiting from the shift that uh, British has referred to in that we are operating under a new model, the MCC model, which is quite different from uh, the approach that uh, previous donors or, or uh, development partners have used in the past. The MCC model is quite refreshing, I have to say, in the sense that it promotes country ownership. It enhances partnerships between government governments and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is the agency of the U.S. government. So I'll speak uh, quite briefly about the way uh, the model or the MCC intervention has enhanced the way we do business back home. The focus or the, the, the benefit of the inter intervention has really uh, been in the area of uh, um, uh, information technology. As you can imagine, uh, some parts of Africa uh, still rely on manual systems. But in this day and age, I think we all agree that that's too archaic if we want to make progress in this world. So the uh, intervention by MCC has helped my country, in a way, to progress faster in the information technology. Connectivity has been a problem in my country, but we are now working on it, and thanks to the MCC support. I'll cite uh, areas in which uh, information technology has moved a step in the right direction. In the health sector, for example, we are building or we have rehabilitated about 138 health centers throughout the country. And for those who know Lesotho or have heard about it, it's a very mountainous country. I don't know whether uh, your lordship, you, you, you know Lesotho or you've been there, but it's a mountainous country. And the terrain is quite challenging. And therefore, connectivity has been one of the big challenges that we've had. What is being done now is that the, the health centers in those remote areas have to be connected to the headquarters, which is in the, in the capital city in order for medical records uh, to be transmitted to headquarters quickly so that planning can take place about what needs to be done so that uh, the, the Minister of Health can be able to provide services to the remote areas. That's one area where the, the intervention has assisted the Minister of Health to improve in its service delivery. We are trying also to, to uh, let me say there's been a pilot study in uh, one hospital where, we, where the system has been installed on electronic medical records. Now, that's an innovation which was unheard of before the MCC intervention because patients used to have little books when they came to the hospital for service. And if you came to the, to the hospital and you, had, you didn't have your book with you, the doctor wouldn't have your medical history. And that was a big problem. But with this system under the pilot, the patients just come in and they put their finger 
and their medical history comes up on the screen. It's, it's, it's refreshing. It's something that we haven't seen in the past, and all because of the intervention by the MCC. Now, there's medical waste which is generated in hospitals, as we all know, and clinics. It's a big problem. What has been helped in the past is that it was just being disposed of in whatever way. But the pilot study was undertaken to say, hey, let's adapt the international standards. Let's deal with medical waste because it's, hazard it's hazard hazardous. And therefore, this pilot study is at the end of completion, and it will be rolled out to the other hospitals to say, let's deal with medical waste in a proper manner. Let me move on to another activity under the compact, the Civil Legal Reform Project. In the, in the local, in the courts back home, <laughs> records were manually written. It was not uncommon for a file to disappear, you know, in a court. And the registrar would probably just not know where it went to. But with the system that we now have, we are saying let's automate everything. We are now automating all the court records and uh, no file will go, you know, will disappear in, in future. It's a great help. We have a U.S. company that has been working with a local private sector IT company in Lesotho to install this system of uh, automation, so automating records. And we see uh, that as a big help in the sense that when the U.S. company leaves after installation of the system and it's operational, the local company will be in a position to maintain the system going forward. And that's the, 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 the benefit of having worked with a local IT company. It's not a, it wasn't a question of company coming in, installing the system and, system and walking away. No, they worked with a local company. We have another uh, project under the land administration reform. Uh, land titles, issuance of land titles was a big problem. And people could not, in a way, use their properties as collateral in the event that they wanted to uh, obtain loans from banks. But we are now uh, installing a system that will maintain records of all titles that have been issued to uh, landowners. Again, a, a move in the right, in the, a, a step in the right, in the right direction, in terms of using technology to improve the welfare of our people. One other big example that I have uh, is the, believe me, we don't have a credit bureau in the Sudan. Can you imagine a credit bureau? We don't have that. But under this intervention, MCC intervention, there is a credit bureau that is going to be established, and the. Um, the regulator is the Central Bank of Lesotho. So the, reg the, the Central Bank of Lesotho is in the process of engaging a consultant who will develop a system that the, the, the Central Bank will use to monitor the activities of the service provider who will be from the private sector. So again, there is an example of a, a government intervention that has helped to enhance the participation of the private sector in my country. Lastly, I just want to touch base very briefly on the water sector. Um, they, we are building a dam in Lesotho that will increase the supply of water. In the rural areas, uh, in all the 10 districts of the country, we are building water systems for uh, the local rural population, which up to now has not have, uh, had access to clean water. So we have examples of rural communities that have already benefited from the supply of water to the extent that they are now able to grow vegetables in their gardens, to feed their children, and even go to the extent of selling the surplus that they have. The other aspect has to do with the availability of water for uh, more wet industries in our country. Believe me, the U.S. is one of our biggest customers for uh, products that are, that are produced in Lesotho for the U.S. market. And we would like to see wet industries increase. And there's a good possibility that with uh, more water supply, the private sector will be able to uh, come in, hopefully, and establish more factories and thereby create jobs for our people. 
So ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, that's the story I have, and we are very grateful that the Millennium Challenge Corporation uh, was able to uh, assist Lesotho, and we are hoping that our people will um, uh, improve their well-being and that in the process they will be able to have better health with all the health interventions that we have received under the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Mahabi. <laughs> Lord Hastings, would you mind if you, we were hoping you provide a response to the panel, if you would, please. ask questions, which is to say how incredibly refreshing I found every single comment that came from the panelists, because these were stories of difference. Uh, these were not short-term projects. These were not minute-by-minute minute little interventions. Uh, this is a real move from projects to prosperity building, and that prosperity building so brilliantly emphasized in Lesotho, and also in the development of the skills of the young, because they're going to decide for themselves how resources that they will make from the bottom upwards are to be invested in the remaking of their countries. So, thrilled. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Hastings. I think I, I, could, I could pull out, uh, out com uh, various strands of this uh, myself, but I suspect there are a lot of knowledgeable people in the audience, and so why don't we move directly to question and answers from the audience. We have uh, some microphones here. Uh, Andrea, you see him here from DevX, and then the woman back there. But first, Andrea, why don't we do this World Bank style, so we'll bunch several of them together. So Andrea, go ahead, please. Great. Thanks so much. Andrea, you seem from DevX Impact. It's a, a site all about partnerships, so please visit. Um, the question is a follow-up on your comment, Ms. Ms. Robinson, about sort of taking the P out of the PPP. So what happens when companies sort of do it themselves? And you pose the question, you know, what does this mean? So I would love to hear from all of you. What, what does that mean? Is it a good thing? And then what is the role for government in that? So thank you. Okay, let's get the, the woman's comment back, question back there. Uh, hi, my name is Dina Al-Kilani. I uh, come from Jordan. I work for the British Embassy in Amman as uh, the head of program leading on political and governance projects. Um, my question actually is to, uh, hi William, <laughs> we remember we met at Peter Millet's uh, office. Uh, my question, as, and actually it's a comment to British and, and, uh, and William, uh, coming from a, from a country that uh, also receives aid from, from uh, uh, three, three um, major uh, donors, uh, uh, US, US uh, government, UK and also the EU, uh, uh, we all understand that they, they all have interests uh, in, in, in Jordan for all obvious reasons. Uh, but, but the issue um, in a country like Jordan is not, is not the interests, it's basically the approaches that these three countries have, have, pers have, have pursued to, 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 re to basically get to their interests. Uh, and I would really like to focus on the, um, the how the streets perceive uh, the the um, the aid that is coming from 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 the from from the US mainly the US uh, and, and US aid and the point about uh, uh, public uh, uh, public uh, uh, private uh, partnership i mean so many so many banks for example we have the standard chartered uh, uh, bank they do a lot of corporate social responsibility in jordan but they refuse to work with uh, um, um, on any project that is co-funded uh, uh, with USAID or even the, uh, um, uh, the, the British government because they know that uh, um, the, the, um, the recipients will, will refuse to take part in this project because you know that conspiracy theory has become a business uh, 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 you know, in, 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 such in, in this part of the world. So basically, uh, these, these corporates or these banks, they actually, they, they chose to work uh, away from the government because they know that if they associate themselves with, with, the, with the US government or the UK government, their business will not succeed and they will not be able to do projects in, in, in these countries. Uh, uh, Tom Ward back there, Sh Chelsea back there. Yeah, Thomas Ward, I, I've been working a lot on the PPPs and I know there's some miscommunication sometime on the PPPs because this seems to be much more on the donor side of things. A lot of PPP is like the UK vision of PPP really came from the financing and procurement as a vehicle and it's getting into how do you actually do investment into given entities 
and the idea behind it is an investment that then returns and grows and the government can then be out of it or donors if it's you know heist or whatever who's in there who they can pull out and it can be self-sustaining on its own instead of a project financing it's turning into life cycle three different questions why don't I just ask each person to take those those comments or questions that they they want to take bill why don't we just we'll just go down the row here bill okay um, um, now your first question was about the street and what what p basically people are thinking of USAID or right and then what companies think of partnering with to be honest with you, I mean, I think conspiracy theories are fascinating and fun to listen to at times, uh, but, and I could be wrong. Uh, you know your country better than I do. Um, I find those th are theories that are kicked around at cocktail parties. In, uh, down where the work is getting done, we haven't found any in the slums of, which are really old refugee camps. Uh, the kids are, are bereft of activities out-of-school activities, after-school activities, civic activities, types of things that would get them engaged with the community and, and while doing so, preparing some, some uh, for work. Uh, we haven't seen any, any pushback really on, on that uh, that I, I think is, is significant, nor in, in a company. I, I get it. Uh, companies wouldn't want to be connected with one government or another or sometimes the, the major superpower of the world, but I think... I think I haven't seen that happen very often, to be honest. And we haven't seen it happen in, in Jordan, where Jordanian companies and other multinationals have come to work with us. Um, it's clear that the, the program, there's so much foreign aid money in Jordan. Uh, other companies are jealous of you. Uh, but uh, haven't seen, seen a lot of that, even though the aid brand on what we're doing and others are doing is, is pretty noticeable. British. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll tackle the, the first question, um, sort of the, the P that's missing. Um, I think that I've seen it in a couple, I don't want to call out the, the companies, um, but I've seen it in a couple of cases where I think the role of government changes from donor to local government. And that's back to Lord Hastings' point. I don't think that's a bad thing because what happens is we start to move towards true sustainability um, and, you know, there's been this sort of almost organic exit strategy, right? And in some cases, that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. And that also frees up, in some ways, the DFIDs and the USAIDs to do other things that are truly intractable. Because if, if the companies are handling, I'm not going to say easier things, but they have a different approach, like technology and things like that, that they're way ahead of USG on. USG can deal with these intractable you know, poverty, deep poverty alleviation types of things. So in some ways, public-private partnerships is starting to, I mean, I'd say in another two years, if this trend continues, are we actually almost building ourselves out of something, but also building clear markets or clear niche for us when we go into us? Oh my God, I've been out of the U.S. government for a year. Excuse me. When the U.S. government goes out of these partnerships, you know, maybe it starts to define and carve that role a little bit deeper, and that's wonderful because that means that this space is truly evolving. Um, but it also says again that we've done a good job of teaching foundation sector, corporate sector, um, and that they are able to handle it kind of frankly on their own directly with local government. The other things that they're doing is they're very smart about it and very clever. I mean, they've hired almost like interlocutors or, or folks um, that, that sort of act on their behalf and they, they sort of make sure that liaise and make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, kind of the way the U.S. government would have played that role. They're almost, almost outsourcing it. Um, and again, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So I hope that answered your question. I've seen some real success, particularly on the health side. I'll speak to that's really more of my content background. Um, on the other point that Tom made around the, the DFID approach, I think that's right. I think um, USG has learned a lot from DFID. I think there's been a number of very successful um, investment models. It's back to my earlier comment. I think those of us who are all working together, many of us in this room, I think the MCC model in and of itself turns development on its head, and that's where I was going earlier. I think the MCC model, PEPFAR, even PMI, things like that, I think we're starting to move towards that, and that's another piece of the evolution, I think, of, pu of public-private partnerships, um, and where I know my colleagues who are now still in this space 
um, are moving towards, and even things like grand challenges, I think, get you to closer to where kind of looking at it from the different perspective. And I think that's, point of fact, the right perspective. Okay, Paula. Yeah, just quickly to build on the PPP theme here, you know, public private partnerships aren't some cookie cutter homogeneous entity. And I think, you know, there are a number of ways of going about them, and each one is unique and depends on local circumstances and the partners involved. I can say, though, that sometimes, uh, you know, as, as speaking from the private sector, it is extremely difficult to figure out among the 16, 60, whatever it is, agencies in the U.S. government that touch development, <laughs> whom to approach, how to approach them, uh, with whom I have to speak, and then getting around all of the various barriers from procurement to staffing to a whole host of to contracting, it's, it's an enormous effort to work with the U.S. government. It really is. And for a company of our size, if, if we're finding that difficult with the kind of staff we have who understand government and NGOs, imagine for a small to medium-sized enterprise, to Bill's point, the future of, you know, really growing partnerships in a meaningful way, how difficult is it for them? So that's one thing that I think is difficult. I think the other thing, you know, as companies become established in, in various toast countries and nationalize their staff, their local staff have relationships with key players in country, whether that's NGO leaders, whether you're talking about the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health. And so there's perhaps they see less of an affinity to, you know, to USAID or others uh, and, and perhaps less value in that kind of intermediary role that AID does play and mm -hmm. has played, for example, a uh, very valuable role in many cases. Well, so my friend Miss Mohapi had to leave because she's going to the White House. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs> and I, a, that's hard. That's a good reason. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, let me let me just take the issue that that Tom raised about uh, their various when people talk about public private partnerships. If you ask the IMF or you ask. Uh, uh, infrastructure companies, there's a very specific sub-definition of the conversation around public-private partnerships around build, operate, and transfer, and it's in, an infrastructure-focused conversation. Uh, and when I said at the beginning was, let's, we're going to use the definition that AID uses for this to, to kind of set the, to, to set the stage for this. So my thought is, is there is some interse inter intersection between uh, both the the larger conversation that we're having here and the and the sub conversation around infrastructure in in areas such as the development credit authority, some of the ways in which MCC is investing and in making uh, making investment decisions, uh, the way OPIC operates and the way IFC is operating. So, and I think that there's a there is a Venn diagram covering covering both. So, I appreciate the the comment, Tom. Um, is, I'm not sure if, uh, has the ambassador arrived? Is the ambassador here? You know, I'm just thinking what we should do is just to stay on time. I'm going to ask the ambassador, uh, the, D the DCM from Sudan, to, to join us up here on stage. I'm going to ask my colleagues from the panel to, to, to step down as the ambassador uh, comes up. We're a very fortunate to have Ambassador um, Obongo, who's the Deputy Chief of Mission for the Embassy of the Republic of South Sudan, who's going to make some comments about the role of the private sector in development of South Sudan. We're very fortunate to have an ambassador, please. Well, you can either speak here or, or um, you can just sit down. That'd be fine. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Good afternoon, all. My name is uh, Dano Obongo. In short, because my mother loved to call me Dano. Uh, I've already you have seen my uh, biography. I'm from South Sudan, the bluff uh, newborn nation on earth. Uh, why South Sudan? Uh, South Sudan economy is booming. And uh, briefly, as some of you may be aware, we got our independent from Khartoum, Sudan, in two, July 2011. So I say to Dan that I'm not from Sudan, I'm from South Sudan. The country is called the Republic of South Sudan. The nation from South Sudan, from Republic of South Sudan, is called South Sudanese. So these are a few things. Uh, so let me take this opportunity also to thank my friend Daniel and the leadership of uh, 
CSIC for inviting me and inviting the embassy. So I thought we'll be very brief and to the point. If you have questions later on, you will ask. So as I say, why South Sudan? The economy is booming, driving up demand for goods and services. As some of you have also known, South Sudan has been marginalized politically, economically, socially for more than 100 years mm. by the Arab Islamic government's regimes in Khartoum. So we are starting from scratch. South Sudan have a lot of opportunities, financial and professional services, hotels and tourism, transport and logistic, retails and whole sales. We are uh, neighboring nine countries in the East Ethiopia, in the North Sudan, and then the West Central Republic of Africa and DRC, and then in the South, Uganda, Kenya. In my beloved country, the Council of Ministers on the 2011 approved the strategic policy framework for the Ministry of Commerce, Industry, and Investment. The Ministry of Commerce, Industry, and Investment developed a strategic policy for three years, action plans to spearhead the economic growth in South Sudan. The strategy is developed in conformity with the South Sudan Development Plan, whose economic sector objective is to advance and accelerate broader based economic growth and sustainable development led by the private sector in South Sudan and with partnership with international private sectors. The Ministry of Commerce, Industry and Investment has diversified private sector, led economic growth and sustainable development that improve livelihood and reduce poverty and creation of employment for the people of South Sudan who have voted for 99% for independence and for the youth who have also a problem in South Sudan and you know South Sudan have 60 ethnic group and these things is a part of the nation building which is also a challenge to us. So we have about 20 banks in South Sudan, one agricultural bank. As I, uh, and South Sudan is potentially very rich with the resources in, uh, in uh, various areas. We have about 30 million hardcakes, herbal land with only 50% currently used range of, economic, of climate zones and rainfall providing water. We have 12 million cattle and 25 million sheep available. So excellent conditions in tree plantations. We have uh, Nile is passing through South Sudan to the north. We have animal production opportunity we have export cash crops, we have fisheries, we have forestry, forestry. We have a lot of opportunity for those who may be interesting and especially private sectors. There are infrastructure shortages in areas, energy, shortfall mean, extensive opportunity in power generation ambition and achievable countrywide roads and building, and also growing and more prosper population mean house building is priority. And of course, the government priority is in agriculture. And you see the South Sudan is potentially a big land, but agriculture is priority. And when the government interest is to see that whoever come there, then agriculture should be the priority. 
and resources. We have oil, gas production, oil refineries, pipelines, mining and minerals. So infrastructure we have, we need power, roads, railways, airport, housing, manufacturing and services, construction materials, consumer goods, financial and business services, retails, transport and logistics. So we are starting from scratch. So the opportunity is you is yours. We have a corporate council on Africa already on the ground from USA here. We have oversee private investment corporation, OPEC, is on the ground there, and is the guarantor for the uh, private sector from USA who want to work in South Sudan. As some of you have follow up in the media recently. On the 16 and 17, the United States, UK, other partners have organized the South Sudan Economic Forum. How to help South Sudan with this few months while we are organizing our oil to go to the international market. And the last day was given to private sector, where our minister for commerce, industry, and investment address the investors and encourage them. So well, I want to appeal to all of you, if you have few, some American dollars, or you have some friends, you are welcome to your second country, South Sudan. All right. Thank you for listening. Ambassador Obongo, thank you very much for being with us. I. Uh, I can't uh, miss the opportunity to uh, reference the fact that my very good friend and mentor, Andrew Natsios, was the President Bush's special envoy to South Sudan. And I know that uh, the United States, in a bipartisan way, both under President Bush, who was very committed to the birth of South Sudan, as well as under President Obama, um, there's been a huge push. USAID had a huge role to do with it, uh, including the, I guess it was the Juba Mountain Peace Accords. The AID had a big role there. Uh, the Norwegians, the United Kingdom also had a big roles to play. And my friend Kurt Reinsma, in, in one of his past lives, was the office director for the Office of Sudanese and South Sudanese Affairs at, at AID. Um, not sure it was necessarily called that at the time, but now it would be called that now. But, uh, but I think that uh, we really are grateful that you would take time out of your busy schedule to be with us. I just want to just cite one investment in particular that I found very interesting. One of the, a very large, you have a very large foreign direct investment. The largest foreign direct investment in South Sudan is a beer company, if I understand it correctly. You just share with us just a, if you talk a little bit about some of the investors that are coming to South Sudan and just spend one minute more about the energy sector because I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about the energy sector in South Sudan in the near future. If you just. Well, as I stated at the beginning, that we are started from scratch, from zero. Then the uh, power and energy is very important. Despite that, we have the water there, and we have also a sunshine uh, weather there, but this has not been uh, used for many years. So, and also we are starting now to go to in uh, some industry, and as you know, the technology cannot work without power. So you go to Juba, you will hear a lot of generators. You will not sleep well. <laughs> So that is mean that that area it need to be addressed. So and it is very important as a newborn nation to learn from the previous countries and then move forward. So this is the area the government have a plan with this uh, water coming from Uganda to build some dams so that can generate uh, some water and power. But I think it will take a little bit, a uh, few years. But with that gap, then there is need for private sectors to come in so that they can also uh, narrow the gap that the government can play a role there. Then they can play with partnership with the private, with the private sector and public sector together. Just, Ambassador, just one more minute. If you just share a little bit more about the energy, the oil and gas. Talk about the oil and gas for a minute. Well, the oil, as we, since we separated 
then we took with us 75% with us in South Sudan. But unfortunately, all the facilities are still in Sudan. And also, we are a landlocked country. So what we need, all the facilities, refinery, the pipelines going from South Sudan to Khartoum, from Khartoum going to Port Sudan, which is the port. Then we have to pay, we have agreed on the 29th September so that we work out how much we can pay. Khartoum was asking us $30 per barrel. We say that is too much, but at last we have reached to compromise. So in gas, we, we are still potential. Uh, we are asking some uh, expert to go and do a lot of mapping and do some research in that area. Because South Sudan is very potential. I will leave some, uh, some uh, papers here around for some of you to go through it. So there is a lot of thing to be done. As you are aware, we are only uh, 20 months old. So, and uh, we are struggling with a lot of things, uh, the nation building and et cetera, and et cetera, ethnic city and all these things. So it is not easy that we need your help. As an American, you have been a friend of South Sudan before independence, and you help us to liberate ourselves. So don't leave us alone. So let us, let the uh, struggle continue. I Ambassador, will you be willing to stick around a few minutes yes. if people want to say hello to you and, and get your business card? So I, I encourage you all to, to shake hands with the ambassador and get his, uh, his business card. And I, I suspect uh, we're going to be hearing a lot more positive things about South Sudan in, in, the, in the near future. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to going to Juba myself um, because it's a, I, I love visiting countries that are very pro-American. And I know South Sudan has got to be 100% pro-American. So I'm, I'm planning to go. Thanks very much. Please uh, well, thank our friend Ambassador Obongo for being with us.